Using machine learning tools to understand the sort of deeper intrinsic qualities about people. Um, you know, this ranges from my work in neuroscience to understanding working memory and attention and language uh, to things that feel much softer, like purpose or perspective taking. But it turns out what all these things have in common is that people rich in those qualities tend to have better lives. Stand by. I'll be right there. Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 343. Today is Sunday, the 6th of October, 2019. And this interview is with Dr. Vivian Ming, frequently featured for her research and inventions in the Financial Times, the Atlantic, and the New York Times. Dr. Vivian Ming is a theoretical neuroscientist, entrepreneur, and author of two books. Vivian has had a truly fascinating life journey, as you'll discover. She co-founded Sokos Labs, which is her fifth company, an independent think tank exploring the future of human potential. In her free time, Vivian has invented AI systems to help treat her diabetic son, predict manic episodes in bipolar sufferers weeks in advance, and reunited orphan refugees with extended family members. In this far-reaching chat with Vivian, we discuss her work on AI, belief-based utility, understanding the messiness of life and of our systems, dealing with homelessness and diabetes, hacking Google Glasses, and a whole lot more. So Dr. Vivian Ming, what a pleasure to have you on my show. You are, you have an amazing story. You are also a theoretical neuroscientist, technologist and entrepreneur, TED speaker extraordinaire, and you co-founded Sokos, where machine learning and cognitive neuroscience combine to maximize students' life outcomes. I've listened to a number of your speeches, and uh, and it sounds like your main mission is exploring the future of human potential, which is a wonderful, um, huge ambition. So, how do you describe yourself, Vivian? Oh my goodness! Uh, you know, I I jokingly uh, refer to myself as a professional mad scientist. Uh, it's the only thing I could think of that really conveyed how I spend my professional life. I'm, I'm a mom and I am a scientist. I used to be an academic before I got the entrepreneurial bug out here in San Francisco. Uh, you know, there are probably a lot of things that describe me, but pro nothing I think really captures me as much as understanding that when someone brings me a problem, Dr. Ming, my child has 500 seizures my son can't enter REM sleep. Please save their life. Uh, I have to be mad because why would I ever say yes to any of that? None of them are my areas of expertise. I studied how to build AI that behaves like the brain. Um, but it turns out at this point in my life, uh, I say yes to projects like that. And then I fund the project. And if we discover anything that works, we give it all away for free at the other end. So if we knew it would work ahead of time, it wouldn't be science. And if anyone else was doing it, it wouldn't be mad. So I guess I'm a professional mad scientist. So you're professionally mad and a professional scientist. Yes, uh, probably clinically mad as well. But fortunately, the world has become much more embracing of people that are a little different. I, I feel, you know, uh, there's a sort of normality that we went through. Let's call it the 1950s. And and now this in France we talk a lot about the bobo, the bohemian bourgeois, and as we get older we've kind of traversed stuff and and the idea of working thirty years in one same company is is let's say our generations, our, our parents' generation, and now there's more and more the expectation that we've got more things in our lives and the newer generation is going to be thirty things, and the idea of being able to say who are you and in one word or I mean you've got it in three words which is brilliant but so often we we struggle because oh well it's, it's going to be complicated <laughs> you got a few minutes I'm going to tell you who I am right well I can get that you know someone for example could look at my life uh, I mentioned work I do in the medical space but it turns out I also uh, have advised the UN on global AI policy. Uh, we work on inclusion in giant companies around the world. We look at education and innovation itself. 
anything and everything involving people. And again, we do it all for free. That may sound strange, working with giant companies for free, but obviously I'm not working for them. I have a bigger interest in mind, which is why it all still distills down to this core concept, which is I believe every life is amazing. Uh, but unfortunately, we do a terrible job of helping people realize mm. that. And so I've had the good fortune now to be able to dedicate myself to that. Maybe what many people miss uh, comes out of one area of my research, which is using machine learning tools to understand the sort of deeper intrinsic qualities about people. Um, you know, this ranges from my work in neuroscience to understanding working memory and attention and language uh, to things that feel much softer, like purpose or perspective taking. But it turns out what all these things have in common is that people rich in those qualities tend to have better lives. And so if I could help someone, uh, say with neuroprosthetics, increase their working memory span, there's a reasonable assumption that they are more likely to live longer uh, earn more, at least as a proxy for productivity, to uh, be happier, actually, in many cases. But it turns out we can look at the same thing for purpose. And I suppose what has really distilled my life for me, why I can articulate it well, is I spent a very long time, uh, both as a scientist and as someone that wondered where the next meal was coming from, mm. really thinking about what my purpose was. Uh, I happen to be very much a humanist. Uh, I didn't look for a purpose um, at, sort of elsewhere in the world. I, I just figured the best thing I could do was live a life that made other people's lives better, uh, which may sound very self-congratulatory, but I just – I needed a better way to make decisions in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and that took me down this path with a lot of clarity. So I can work in many different fields. Mm. I can do not 30 things. Literally right now here at Sokos Labs, we have 60 open projects, uh, any one of which you could build an entire company or nonprofit around. Um, but to me, they're all the exact same problem. Uh, there is an amazing life which hasn't been recognized, isn't being fostered, and you know, when there's a kid with a traumatic brain injury and we can actually build a technology that stimulates the synchrony between parts of their frontal lobes and the rest of their brain and it gives them back the working memory capabilities that they were originally born with, now I have the chance to put the pen back in that child's hand to write their own life story. So I'm this wild mix of a hard number scientist and this crazy utopian aspirationalist that um, that is very happy with that dissonance between the two. Mm. When you're working with anybody, let's say who has a challenge, they, they come to you with a problem. I would say the same thing in the work that I do with companies that say, well, I have an issue, our product innovation is not fast enough or efficiencies are not good and that. At some level, there needs to be a desire for change underneath that, that the attitude isn't the technology that's going to help me, it's the attitude with the technology. And when you're looking at a kid and saying, well, you know, I want to help you with your neural issue, you also presumably need to embark them and have them embrace and, 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 and do they need to have a purpose? I mean, how... How do you manage the mindset component to the success versus the technology? It's interesting because everything you're saying is true and profound, and there are parallels between individuals and organizations and, I believe, even whole societies. Uh, so let's look at the organizational level to start with. There's been a lot of work, for example, in inclusion recently, uh, work that might sound uh, kind of disheartening. Uh, looking at gender inclusion or racial inclusion in Europe or in the United States. And the most recent findings say it doesn't matter what you do if the company doesn't actually believe, as a matter of its intrinsic culture, that um, diversity brings actual value. If they don't believe it, you can run all of the interventions you want. You can do anti-bias training, empathy training. Turns out empathy training is great. It makes people feel bad while they continue to not hire people that are different than them. 
Uh, so you get all the worst of both worlds. Hmm. Um, and then again, we see this in individuals. So uh, one of my favorite new constructs I work with, that's me being a wonky scientist, uh, uh, but this is a, a behavioral economics construct called belief-based utility. Um, so like a lot of behavioral economics, it looks traditionally at a lot of strange biases we have in when we make judgments. Um, I actually extend it a little more broadly, and I describe it as the belief that your hard work will pay off. Well, most people might intellectually understand that if I'm poor, if my family's poor, but I've worked incredibly hard, I earned a scholarship to go to Harvard or Stanford, that that is a ticket. It's a ticket to another life. It's a ticket out. Um, and yet we see enormous numbers of young, brilliant people from those very underrepresented backgrounds not accepting those scholarships. And you, it seems so irrational. Um, and most people approach it almost like a marketing problem. Didn't you understand that university wouldn't be a difference? Uh, you know, women in the corporate world, didn't you understand that if you worked a little bit harder, you could earn more money and go further? Well, it turns out all of these people fully understand these abstract ideas. Uh, yes, I can pass the classes. Yes, I can earn a degree from MIT. But what's the point? If I'm just going to end up back on the farm, back in the neighborhood. Helping my parents. Exactly. If I work my ass off harder than the guy next to me, and there's still no way I'm ever going to join the senior leadership of this country company, and I know I won't because I can look up and see them right now. So this is where this concept of belief-based utility comes in. If you don't believe your hard work will pay off, it doesn't matter what you're capable of. You will never choose to act in that way. Uh, so a good chunk of our work is actually appreciating exactly these sorts of complexities. Mm -hmm. Yes, we build tools. Um, but going back to that individual level, I often say, um, you know, craftsmen without a tools are hobbled, but they're still amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, tools without a craftsman is pointless. <laughs> and yet our, our education system, our hiring systems, companies are almost entirely focused on the tools, the skills, the knowledges. Mm. Uh, well, particularly given the kind of work I do, we're increasingly living in a world where those tools are intelligent themselves. Right. Uh, what's left is what you can do to explore the unknown. What's left is the creativity you can bring to the world. And if you don't perceive that there's value in that work, if you just want that job, I, got a, I went to a good university, I learned a bunch of valuable rote skills, now I want to spend the next 30 years of my life uh, doing risk assessments on loans, well, that job is not going to exist anymore. Uh, so this is where it bonds a, a lot of this together, is we can look at traditionally disenfranchised populations uh, poor uh, or uh, minority populations um, that in some ways have given up on the promise of society. But we can also look at, you know, the professional middle class today and see a very similar context in which uh, if you don't believe that hard work is going to pay off, uh, it will drive you to make decisions uh, which don't serve your interest. And no tool I can give, I can teach you how to program, I can teach you about machine learning. Uh, it's not of any value if you're not willing to every day go out and answer a new question that no one's ever answered before because that's where human value lies. I think it's where it's always been. What we're stripping away now is all the other aspects that used to contribute value, um, but, you know, is increasingly getting automated. When you talk about belief, where does ambition fall into that? Is that part of the belief? Yeah, so I, I guess I should be clear, you know, I'm a computational neuroscientist. So when I talk about belief, it's reasonable to assume in my head I have some equations like Bayesian models I'm thinking about deeper structures in, um, you know, superorbital frontal cortex and, and other areas. So belief for me is maybe not as readily accessible as maybe many people refer to belief. 
Uh, so when I when we run some of our analyses, for example, looking at wage gap and women notionally choosing to work less than men, and then we run our models and we say, well, it looks like the reason they make those choices is um, that they are rationally believing that their hard work won't pay off. So the, the irony is the fact that um, women uh, earn less because they supposedly choose to work less creates this system, which then trains other women to work less because they don't believe that extra work will pay off. And we could generalize outside of women. Um, so, yeah, of course, ambition is deeply tied up into many of these questions, not the least of which is because there's sort of a big mystery. Uh, I'm obviously not describing everyone. There are these amazing bootstrappers that come out of some of the most miserable conditions uh, and revolutionize the world. Uh, I don't think you can build a society on anecdotes and exceptions, but understanding where those people come from is incredibly valuable. Um, and so thinking about belief and ambition, uh, I like to understand the messy system of, of society, of a community, and of an organization, because people don't make their decisions in isolation on the one side, and we don't have enough of those spontaneous bootstrappers to fill all of society's needs on the other side anyways. So how do we build a culture in which people's ambitions not only can be realized, uh, but in which we don't accept anything less uh, mm -hmm. uh, of ourselves? You know, when I live here in Berkeley, we have a serious homelessness problem here, and it's our fault. Um, I don't say that as a trivial statement. It's incredibly complex. There's no magic wand that will fix this whole problem here. But if I don't own the fact that some guy is passed out on the street is partially my fault, then it will never get fixed because uh, there are aspects of the decisions I make or that we make collectively – as a community here in Berkeley that have led to this problem. Uh, and we have to recognize, yes, of course, this person could make different decisions in their life. But the simple truth is that's not magically going to happen if we don't look at the entire system as part of the problem. Uh, so, you know, that's the, the most dismal side of this. Uh, and it really is heartbreaking. Uh, but we look at the more aspirational sides. And, and in my work, uh, I get to have, for example, just published this paper about building systems to help my son. Uh, he has diabetes, and so That's I hacked lot. all of his medical <clears throat> equipment. Uh, yeah, and got to build one of the first ever AIs for diabetes. And then later, he's just to make his life even more fun, he was diagnosed with autism. It wasn't a big surprise to anyone. Um, but there's some real challenges that come with autism as well, maybe not life threatening in an immediate sense. Uh, but he has challenges with understanding other people and, sure. uh, you know, with dealing with the world uh, at, at the kind of social level that most of us take for granted. So I did the same thing. I, I got a Google Glass and I hacked it and I built a system that could read facial expressions. Mm -hmm. uh, this was years ago at the time that I did it. Uh, and then, you know, use that with the idea that he could learn how to read other people's facial expressions, uh, something that is often um, – not natively available to people on the spectrum. Sure. Uh, so there's this technology, but it only works um, because someone with some crazy ambition, in my case, went in and actually, you know, applied it uh, in a way that created value in the world. So, uh, yeah, you're right. There's no way for us to just invent our way out of these problems. They are, as I often say. Um, they are all, in the end, uh, fundamentally messy human problems, and they will only ever have messy human solutions. But it is the case that technology can often change the economics of those solutions, yeah. uh, make something which is sort of uh, a solution that's only available to the most selected few potentially available to everyone. Uh, and that's really where I focus my efforts in this field is building tools uh, that recognize the the messy complexity of the real world, uh, and then really try and offer them up for free because the people, the people that are most likely to use technologies are the ones that need it the least. Hmm. So being messy, 
I like this concept and um, yeah, I'm more on the messy side than the scientific side. I, I come from a literary background and apply and history and, and, and yet I went into business and I, but I, I tried to embrace that side of me. And as I wonder about the development of, of scientists and AI, which of course tend to lead to more engineering, very methodical types of mindsets, to what extent do you believe that humanities is a, a necessary portion of our education in general, if you want to be an AI? So, uh, you know, I referred to the idea earlier that um, many of the things that predict the best life outcomes sound like they're these very soft qualities, creativity, emotional intelligence, social skills, do you understand other people's perspectives? Um, do you have a growth mindset, a strong analogical reasoning, self-assessment? That may not sound like it pushes all the way into um, the social uh, sciences and the humanities. Uh, but in fact, I actually think, again, that technology is just a layer on top of that, uh, that probably all throughout human history. Uh, the thing that has distinguished the people with the most exceptional life outcomes uh, from everyone else has always been their ability to be adaptive, to be creative, to not just solve problems, but explore the unknown. Uh, and science is a methodology, one of many possible methodologies for exploring the unknown. But technology itself, engineering, is really just taking what we already know and making it available in, a, in this you know, tangible fashion. So I think there's fundamentally at the heart of these issues uh, uh, is very human. Uh, I often have said, uh, actually, I was interviewed for um, uh, the Today show in the BBC um, and was asked what I was most concerned about with AI. And I'm sure many people might say, you know, Skynet uh, or the flaws of AI, the bias reinforcement, a lot of discussion of what's going on. Um, you know, I'm not particularly fearful of super intelligent AI just because no one's invented it, uh, not even something remotely close to it. Uh, you know, it's worth thinking about the same way it's worth thinking about how an asteroid might hit the right. planet. Um, but what actually scares me is that we have an entire generation of largely young, largely men that doesn't make them bad, but Hey, diversity helps, uh, the, their entire career in machine learning and artificial intelligence has been their academic education in which they were given a prefabricated data set like ImageNet, this database of a massive millions and millions of pictures. They're all been hand labeled already. Mm -hmm. And then they were given a very specific task. Uh, I want this system to find as many dog breeds in these pictures as accurately as possible, a fairly standard AI competition. And then we're going to try and get an extra quarter of a percent accuracy for the computation at a big conference, ICLM, and that will be your PhD. So you'll have spent your entire career learning how to build more uh, exquisitely sophisticated hammers, but you will have never built a house in your entire life. Mm -hmm. In 20 years of doing the kind of work I do, I have never, ever had anyone give me a perfect data set, an explicit question, and the right answers. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. You've got to create them yourself. Uh, absolutely. So now we have this world in which we're hoping uh, that these young people that have been supremely well trained to build better algorithms will now not only figure out how to go from hammers to houses, but will figure out how to build all of society. And I think that is a fundamental flaw. They need to learn how to solve problems. And neither science nor engineering have a monopoly on how to solve problems. I love science. Um, but its traditional formulation is plotting, uh, and it assumes a world that can be easily broken down into simple experiments. 
what I've learned in this latter part of my life is sometimes you need to go out and get messy and try and solve a problem in the real world and see what happens. And presumably you would apply that to education in general. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, maybe some of this is my own bias. I, in my own education, I was deeply interdisciplinary. Yes, in scientific fields, but my home department was psychology. But I also did my PhD work uh, in neuroscience using the techniques of machine learning. So right from the start, I was looking at human behavior and brains and machines all at the same time. And so it comes very naturally to me to then say, well, maybe a little economics would be interesting here as well. And a little um, cultural anthropology to study people in situ out in the world. Um, in fact, let's throw it all into the mix. Uh, you know, I've begun to get uh, excited about certain fields like computational sociology. Sorry. You might have been back. told by somebody. <clears throat> yeah, it seems that that's what happened. I apologize. No worries. Uh, but I was talking about computational sociology and even computational linguistics. I have loved recent work using AI to explore masses of history. Sorry, someone's not taking a hint here. <laughs> Uh, so I, I mentioned this idea that probably through all of human history, these kinds of constructs like working memory and perspective taking and purpose have been predictive of life outcomes. Well, I'm not pulling that out of a hat. People have done some fascinating work. One of my favorite is someone that went through an, using computational linguistics to analyze the speeches of famous historical leaders to show that it turns out what people were once calling 21st century skills turned out to be incredibly valuable in the 16th century um, and probably have always been incredibly valuable. So now we really open this up and understand that um, AI and machine learning are themselves just tools. Uh, they aren't solutions to problems. They're not magic wands. And that fundamentally it is our human capacity to explore the unknown that allows us to create value with these tools, just the same as we might create value uh, with a paintbrush or a typewriter. Uh, boy, I didn't, how quickly I've become a person that can date myself with a reference. Right. Um, and in that sense, it's amazing and it's powerful. And you understand then science itself and the application of AI to these very dry, hard numbers fields are themselves an art, uh, and there isn't a right answer to them. And certainly speech making is an art. My friend Jeremy Waite at IBM works with Watson. As a speaker, he decided to apply Watson to look at speeches from the past to try to understand how they, what were the similarities, what made them great. So I, I totally follow in on that. I want to get on to the diabetes story that with your son, because obviously as a type 1 diabetic, I'm, immensely perked my interest and and generally speaking my experience has been that these technologies say well you know if you give me good data i'm going to give you good results so that meant that i had to calculate my 60 grams of uh you know potatoes and my 40 grams of bread and this and that and then if i, well, I put it in then the that says well this is how much insulin you needed duh you know <clears throat> i got yes. that part it's, so I was, you know it's a was, frustrating space so I was wondering if you're, when you looked at this, you know, because I mean, I'm thinking with most AI, shit in, shit out, good data, you know, lots of data, actually, that's the key. And then you can possibly get something out of it. When it comes to individuals in compliance, especially in type 1 diabetes, it's an important part of the mindset. So I was wondering what sort of messiness you were looking at in type 1 diabetic you know, this is actually really gets at one of the areas where I think, interestingly enough, my work with brains was very informative, which is brains are noisy. Brains are unreliable. An individual neuron, no one is quite certain what it's doing. If you stimulate it, something happens, 
but it seems kind of probabilistic, or maybe it's chaotic, or maybe it's quantum. I mean, no one has a totally clear idea. We've learned so much, and yet there's still so much to learn. So then my son gets diagnosed with diabetes. My wife and I, both scientists, start collecting all of this data, thinking, of course, our doctors would love us. You know, if we walk in the door with 10 pounds worth of spreadsheet, uh, they were not thrilled, uh, let's say. And, you know, the message we received as parents was, you know, there's nothing you can really do here other than stay calm and do your best and, and try. Uh, you know, it was almost all the messaging was just about, um, in a sense, do the minimum. Don't, don't give up, which is wonderful. But there is so much more that we can do. So my immediate take, and forgive the cursing here, but was that you've got to be fucking kidding me. I make models of the brain. Are you really telling me that diabetes is more complex than that? And the way we're able to make models of the brain is by respecting the fact that it is unknowable, at least to absolute precision. So you build a model that says probabilistically, this is what this activity might mean. Um, so that was the same approach that I took here, is to say, I don't know everything. I don't know what my five-year-old may have eaten in the middle of the night. I don't know how his cortisol levels um, are varying over the day. There are just things that I might someday be able to know with more accuracy, but right now they're unknowable. So let's actually represent that in our model, that certain things aren't knowable or are at least unknown. You might be surprised to know that that is not common in modern AI practice, we tend to treat all data as truth when you throw a deep neural network at it. Uh, and you just assume that truth is kind of, has a, is, a, is actually a little bit of random noise that will get averaged out over time. Well, a lot of this isn't random and it isn't noise, it's just unknown. And so we built a model that respected that. So uh, there are so many things, as you well know, that go on in complex endocrinology uh, in treating type 1 diabetes. So we simply built a system that said, given everything we do know, uh, every five minutes we get a rough estimate of blue blood glucose levels from his CGM. Um, I did build a little AI that went out and scraped all the nutrition information from the U.S., Food and Drug Administration, and because we eat a lot of uh, dim sum uh, from the same at Hong Kong. Uh, and so we didn't just look at carbs, we looked at fat, protein. Uh, mm -hmm. The system took into account what order you ate it in. It still was a lot of data tracking, but it never assumed that, the, that all of the data was there, or that the data that was mm -hmm. there was true. It simply said, given everything we know, uh, what it's a bit like... Um, Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, given all the clues that I can actually see, what's the story that best explains what's going on right now? Mm. And from that, what should you dose? And it turns out that was a pretty big revelation, at least for us, uh, to build a system that could very accurately make predictions an hour into the future about whether my son's blood glucose levels will go high or low. It and was it still. Doesn't... Sorry, go ahead. You, you look at the different times of the day, and and do you look at the weather as well? I mean, there's so many yeah, other things that I feel so impact many me. Potential things into account. His activity level. So the original version, we collected data exhaustively: uh, perspiration, heart rate, um, activity levels. Uh, we're looking in in other domains. I looked uh, built a system once to predict manic episodes and bipolar sufferers, and sure enough weather conditions, ambient noise were strong predictors. So, but one of the things I often try to do is simplify it down. It's one thing for me as a hyper-obsessed, um, mad scientist parent to collect all of this data and ha really genuinely have to hack a lot of uh, legally protected devices to be able to do it. Um, it's, it's a frightening thing to meet the president and have to confess that you broke federal law. Um, but in this case, I really wanted to distill it down. Let's say we only had one device, that continuous glucose monitor. Would that be enough 
to provide value. Not perfect, not at all, but just immediate passive value. So we're building a new version of this system now based only on that. Uh, in other words, if we could change, for example, um, the background drip rate, the basal rate, that slow release of insulin in the background, not based on what your blood sugar is right now, but based on what we predict, predict it will be averaged over the next several hours, what would be the optimal background rate? And it's an early simulation right now, but it turns out it pretty substantially changes um, the likelihood of entering highs without a significant increase in lows. And you might think, but how could you possibly know whether I'm going to eat in the future? But we find in this continuous glucose data, we don't see data about endocrinology or about insulin release or about digestion. I see the story of a little boy. And it mm -hmm. turns out that little boy has patterns in his life. Mm -hmm. um, the data becomes an, a, a viewing glass into that story. And again, looked at from that lens, which may sound very human and very sort of humanities oriented, uh, but I look at hard numbers through that lens and it's a big transformation in how you approach a problem like this. It makes me think about how can you then adapt that to another kid? Because you've got your son's story, his ways and his moods and the way he sleeps and all that and then so you've got that all working in one program and now you kind of have to do it all over again in, in the way I'm thinking about it oh my gosh for another kid so you certainly could deploy in a sense the raw program and have it learned from scratch all over again uh, so one domain that's a bit like this for us is in education we built this system which again we give away for free and it's meant to help parents with their kids. Uh, it collects voluntary information from the parents. Uh, essentially, it asks them questions. They can answer or not, totally up to them. We don't use the data for anything other than this sp specific system. And then what it does is every night, it creates an activity for the parent to do with the child. Now, it's very personalized. It, it is creating an activity for that parent to do with that child, or foster parent, or god right. parent, whatever it might be. And, um, so we could end up in the same trap there. Obviously, what we're trying to do is learn about that specific child, their unique patterns, but also learn about all kids. So some kids are somewhat similar to you. In mm -hmm. fact, our system, when I says it asks questions, when it chooses the next question, it's, it's a database that's mm -hmm. full of thousands and thousands of questions. And in a sense, it introspects. And it says, if I knew the true answer to one single question tonight, which one would tell me the most, not just about this child, but about all the children in the entire system? Uh, because maybe uh, there's a question about this child, which is very uncertain. But there's another question uh, that we could ask, which would actually be applicable to many, many kids that are similar in that way. So uh, getting wonky in my language, we look at sort of hierarchical models that can simultaneously learn what kids have in common, but also what make them unique. Uh, and so we employ that sort of a methodology to understand that this person's diabetes, this child's education, this person's confrontation with bipolar disorder are unique, and yet they share patterns with other people. So the system can learn the patterns and the differences at the same time. It seems like a lot of it's about asking the right question. Vivian, I want to ask one last question because it's sort of where my mojo is, is this notion of AI and emotion or and AI and empathy. And just where, where, where do you think that's going to go? And do you think it's feasible to maybe at the very least to read em emotions and maybe to imbue or impart empathy? So there are probably three big, fascinating questions there. And the first one, for me personally, goes back 20 years. My first ever machine learning project was helping, as, a, as an undergrad, an academic, to design a system to read facial expressions for the CIA. Ooh. So morally gray, uh, even as an American, morally gray. Um, 
and and the rest of the world probably has their own uh, happy relationship with the U.S. CIA. Sure. But working on that project, being able to build a system that then required oodles of computing power, of, you know, incredibly constrained situations, um, but working on this system for my undergraduate honors thesis that could actually tell whether someone was happy or not. That was part of the system that I later built into Google Glass for my son. It's sure. part of the system that I built years later in a project for the UN to try and reunite orphan refugees with extended family members. So the question, can modern machine learning recognize emotion, emotion in spoken language, what we call prosody, uh, emotion in faces, emotion in text? Absolutely. And in fact, that undergraduate lab spun off as a startup got bought by Apple, and uh, if anyone's watching that on an iPhone 10, uh, that system's ability to read facial expressions, the emojis that the system plays around with, we talked about all that 20 years ago because that's it's all powered by my undergraduate lab. Um, so we built a system that allows Siri to understand love. Well, yeah. exploit the human weakness <laughs> of love, maybe more accurately. Yeah. Um, so then that's the next level is, well, can it really? So we built a system that can recognize it, that can run the numbers. Can it actually exploit those emotions? Uh, again, the answer is very clearly yes. Again, I'll, I'm going to put it in the context of the work we do, which I think is is much more positive look at it. But you can use it any way you choose to. Again, it's a tool. Um, so we build these systems, for example, in bipolar systems, but also in education to understand that in a given moment, uh, a child's emotional state is going to influence uh, what they're learning and how they're learning, uh, or even in employment. Uh, we once built a system that would monitor the eye movements of individuals uh, and pull out from that mood states and personality quantities. And the goal was, again, purely on the AI for good side, uh, you know what? You should actually take a break. Uh, right. You know. As opposed to the Chinese the model, which is yes. trying to evaluate how well you're going to learn the next thing, you know. And yes, so there's different ways you can approach these problems. And uh, I take a very human centric approach. What actually supports this particular individual in the moment with the goal of m maximizing the long term gains. But then there's the last element to this. Will AI ever truly understand emotions? Will it ever have it itself? Will it ever have a real relationship with people? Uh, so my answer here is, um, first off, there is no such thing today, uh, period. Um, but that doesn't mean I, I can think of no theoretical reason why we won't ha someday have uh, machines that are intelligent in the way we are intelligent. Maybe in a constrained way, as in, you know, you'll do the work on, I'll do it with Vivian Ming, and I will figure out until the nth degree that I've got that little smirk, the little, you know, subtle look, that da 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 da, I can get you. And, and, you know, once I can get you, maybe I'll be able to do it with others. But the idea of generally getting everybody's context, bah. Well, it's big. And also, there's the broader question is, is the system pushing numbers? So, for example, DeepMind's AlphaGo system doesn't understand anything about Go. It understands how a set of input numbers turn into a set of output numbers. Just so happens that that will beat the world's best Go players easily. Uh, but unfortunately, it will continue to play Go when the game is Baccarat. You know, it will play Go when the house is burning down around it. So when will these systems actually have a sense of their own stakes? Uh, right. well, Self-consciousness. Uh, and... Exactly. And that is a bridge we haven't crossed. Uh, again, I don't think anything theoretically prevents it. Um, I, I think that we need, however, a fundamentally different approach to AI before we reach that point, for good or evil, uh, before we reach that point. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, I said my... My biggest fear about AI right now is we have a bunch of young people that haven't actually been trained in how to solve human messy problems. My other big fear is pretty genuine as well, which is uh, there is a ready market for all everything we're talking about. Um, and that market is authoritarians, uh, whether you're private or uh, a company, a sovereign entity. Uh, 
these are extremely powerful tools to allow powerful organizations to concentrate even more power in their own hands. And the AI does not need to be self-aware. It doesn't need to be uh, RTD2 uh, or the Borg or Skynet for it to be used as a tool to undermine civil rights. And that is something that truly does scare me. Seems to me that there is this, I mentioned ambition, I often talk about the other two keywords, which are accountability and ethics. And uh, and what you're talking about there is the intentionality. And if the intention is, is bad, well, these tools will be used badly and uh, we're in for trouble. Vivian, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I really enjoyed this chat. Um, how can someone who's listening to this ever do anything to, uh, you know, reach out, help uh, do what would you like them to do as a call to action, if not only just to follow you, read up what you're doing? Listen, I've got two things. If you really want to know about our work, uh, you can visit socos.org, S-O-C-O-S dot org. And we have a newsletter where we actually write stories about the crazy mad science projects that we do. And uh, feel free to um, sign up for that and we share it. It doesn't cost anything. We just like being able to share our work. Um, and happy always to collaborate with groups from individuals on. If you have a mad science pitch, that you think could make a meaningful, positive change in the world, then pitch us. If I like it, I'll pay for it. We'll do it. Uh, but the last is you don't need to wait for me. You don't need to wait for a VC or the Gates Foundation or your parents or your board or your boss or anyone else. Uh, my favorite way of talking about purpose is the, uh, a version of the old saying, the world gets better when old men plant trees. Well, the most amazing truth of life is tonight you can go plant a tree and you don't need anyone's permission. You just have to choose to do something good, appreciate the world is messy and go out and get started. Uh, it doesn't need to involve me at all, but if I can help, drop us a line and we will do everything we can uh, to build the most amazing forest. A wonderfully inspirational ending. Vivian, thank you so much. It was a super pleasure. Thank you. All right. So that was just fabulous, Vivian. I really appreciate that. So I'm, I, I have a little, my mouse problem. So I have, um, I'm based in London and Paris. Bijou uh, Menon was the guy who put us together. That's right. Um, and because I couldn't remember his name before, but that's now came through me is the mind works in weird ways. I, I like to explore the mind. I'm, um, I'm writing a new book and hashing it out with the publisher about talking about LSD and and the power, powerful, wonderful elements of uh, psychedelics in, in the brain. Is that something that you explore as well? So I don't run the lab in that space, but I think there's been, uh, you know, most of, so we could look at um, nootropics using drugs to... Um, expand the capabilities of the mind. We can look at genetics. My focus has largely been in, in direct technological intervention on the brain. Uh, however, the work looking um, at LSD and a number of other psychoactive drugs Psych recently. Psychosilibin. Uh, yeah, and its use in um, uh, working through traumatic experiences, extinguishing, PTSD. Um, yeah, PTSD, extinguishing phobias, uh, and other challenges people have had, I think is pretty amazing. Um, and so while it's not a, an active area of research for me, um, I'm always heartened uh, when I see people making progress. I have my own work in dementia, for example, um, using uh, uh, stimulative technologies to actually reduce the uh, uh, symptom load of Alzheimer's. Mm. which is amazing. And if you'd asked me five years ago if that was possible, I'd have said mm. it was crap. Um, or, the, again, the work in diabetes I, I'm really proud of. That work is going on in parallel in genetics uh, mm -hmm. and in uh, pharmacological approaches. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. I, I don't need to win that race. Uh, I think everyone pushing forward on that stuff together, mm -hmm. uh, when we're focused on solving the problem and mm -hmm. being mercenaries about what it takes to solve it, uh, uh, pragmatic, that's, pragmatic. Uh, yes, yes. Um, you know that's where I'm. I'm really uh, happy to see 
um, the people exploring because one of the things that, you know, I sometimes get asked, what would I do? I, you know, I have the good fortune of my life of having um, way more money than the vast majority of the people of the world to spend on my work. Um, but I'm not wealthy on the order of some of my tech billionaire um, uh, fellows here in the Bay Area. So what would I do if I had all of Bill Gates's money or all of Jeff Bezos's money? Um, and the simple truth is I wouldn't pick one big thing. I wouldn't run the Gates Foundation. I wouldn't spend a billion dollars on one idea in education or one area in health. I would spend what I already spend today, um, tiny amounts of Just money, with small teams of very intelligent people, each trying to solve a single problem uh, in a modest, modest way. I, I don't think the world is full of moonshots. I think the mm. world is full of little mad science experiments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and sometimes those incremental things turn into something much bigger. Mm. Uh, so I'd actually in a sense, play the market. Instead mm. of you know r running five giant things, I would run thousands of them uh, across numerous different domains. Because I believe that broad series of experimentation is what it actually takes uh, to truly explore the real world. My cousin, Fabrice Garanda, is a, um, he's sort of more on the spectrum <laughs> in terms of social, uh, social skills, but his approach, he's an angel investor and quite wealthy. And his idea is to be to invest in in many more things every year. So he's he's very much like you, sort of sprinkling. And so he does about a thousand investments a year, which is quite a lot because he does due diligence and his whole approach. But it's sort of there's a, a match, except he's not really in the humanity space. Although he's he started to take LSD and he read my book. He read my book on empathy. So working on him. All right, Vivian, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for that wonderful stay in touch. If I can ever do anything of you in London, Paris. Lovely. I will let you know. All right, super. Have a good one. Thanks so much. Thank for Bye. Bye. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish... Here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. Trust in my reason. 